This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Tootie Cole on May 21st, 2019 in Oregon City, Oregon for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much. You bet. So excited to meet you. Yeah, pleasure. I'm a psycho fan. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> not like a, not a bad psycho. No, no, really in, but in a good way. In right? a good yeah, way, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so these interviews, we start at the beginning. It's sort of like a, this is your life. Uh, where did you grow up? Right here in Portland. Born in Emanuel Hospital and um, uh, lived uh, in southeast Portland most of my life. First on 103rd and then Claret on 146th. Um, went to uh, Catholic, you know, grade school, then high school. <laughs> Twelve years of it. <laughs> what did your um, What did your parents do? Um, my dad um, originally drove truck for a laundry service, and then uh, when I was growing up, and um, what I usually remember him doing was um, he sold for um, investments for IDS, which later became American Express. So a lot of it was kind of retirement plans and uh you know mutual funds that kind of stuff for people and your mom my mom is pretty much just a homemaker um she used to do a lot you know do ironing on the side to pay for my tuition and um a, a lot of stuff and then later after i was grown and gone she worked uh, for nabisco and you know just kind of did that kind of stuff and you said you have seven siblings yeah where well there was seven of us all together seven all together yeah yeah i have an older uh, an, uh, an older sister, an older brother who passed away, and then me, then my sister Colleen, she's about four years younger than me, and then my uh, three brothers, Pat, Mike, and Kevin. How did you all, what was your relationship like with them growing up? Like when you were Great. Young? I mean, I really had a, a blast with my, with my older brother, Carl. He was like eight years older than me and just a hellion. So we had all kinds of fun stuff together, you know. He brought some, uh, he brought some mice home from, from school during summer break that the teacher was trying to get rid of. And of course he didn't want to tell my mom. So we hid him in the garage in a drawer and called him Mickey and Minnie. And uh, just, you know, just, he just did crazy stuff like that. We'd dig for night crawlers together so we'd go fishing and just, you know, whatever. My sister Carol's 10 years older than me and she's awesome because she can kind of she just turned 80, I just turned 70. So she's kind of always been there to go, it's okay, you're going to get through this particular part of your life, it's going to be all right, which is really nice, you know. And then they were old en enough older than me that they were pretty much gone, so I always grew up feeling like I was the oldest of us five. And, um, you know, just took on a lot of responsibilities because of that. It was just a natural thing to do. Started babysitting when you're nine years old and taking care of your brothers and sisters and working in the berry fields and, you know, the whole work ethic that I grew up with having parents that survived World War II um, really made me who I am. Same with Fred. Um, he had a similar, um, you know, thing going on. His parents actually split up when he was about that age, nine, nine and a half, and he was the man of the household worked to help keep his mom and his sisters, you know, happening. So we were both very much on that same wavelength mm -hmm. as far as um, our values. Yeah. yeah. Um, what kind of kid were you in general? Were you introverted? Were you oh, extroverted? very introverted. Shy as hell, self-contained, uh, loved reading books. Um, you know, honestly, I always, you know, we used to joke about, how, what we would have become if we'd never met each other. And my whole thing was, well, I probably would be a librarian or, you know, like, in the, it's a wonderful life when he goes and meets his, his wife who he's never, you know, they, they just have never met. You know, somebody like that. That's who I always pictured myself that I would be. Not this, that's for sure. So, uh, yeah, or a teacher or, you know, something like that. But, you know, something academic. Um, and I know you've said that you didn't really start start really playing an instrument until you were 30, but when did you first become interested in music and who, who were some of your first I musicians? actually became more interested in just being on stage, period. I mean, I, I was very shy and introverted, but I would see movies and then me and the kids that live next door, you gotta realize at the point there was kids everywhere. I mean, millions of kids your own age. And so we put on these uh, plays and you know, stuff in the backyard and would charge kids a penny to come in. And of course the monetary thing's always been in there. 
You know, so performing, period, has always appealed to me. <clears throat> but um, I honestly, I played piano growing up, and that was it. But, you know, didn't do anything besides piano recitals. But um, I've always loved music and was completely, you know, evolved in, you know, being a psycho fan, as you say, of the Beatles, the Stones, you know, everybody from that particular era. Dylan, Joan Baez, um, listening to all those albums over and over and over again. And uh, music's always been a really huge part of my life. And, um, and then, you know, volunteering at uh, this coffee house, uh, helping them clean up and whatever, and that's where Fred and I met. And uh, again, same with the music was a big draw for that as well. So was um, you said you used to do these plays? Yeah. Um, was creativity something that was encouraged in your household by your parents or? Um, th well, you know, like most parents from that particular generation, the coolest thing about being a kid and growing up then is that you really just got left alone on your own. You know, we just, and, and, and the entertainment that you had to come up with was uh, evolved from whoever in the neighborhood said, hey, let's do this, let's do that, you know, blah, blah, blah. That was your entertainment. And there was always one kid who would come up with crazy ideas and everybody else would figure out how to get it done. So, you know, that part of it was just was my generation, I think. It's, it's not that it was encouraged, it was allowed. <laughs> That's true. You yeah. know? Uh, and what kind of student were you? Was, was school or education something that interested you? Yeah, pretty good. You know, I always wanted to please. Biggest part of the nuns, you know, the, their, their big thing was, you know, Kathleen, we're so disappointed in you. And you're like, oh, my God. Oh. You know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, school was, was whatever. I always did well in school, you know. It was, was kind of, it was just there. It was something you were supposed to do. Um, well, you just said your, so your name is Kathleen. Where, when did you, how did Tootie? In high school, um, like I say, I went to an all girls Catholic high school and the three names were Kathy, Linda, and Debbie, that every other girl was named that. So in my sophomore year, it was kind of like, you know, whoever got called is like, Kathy, Kitty, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, like six girls would turn around. And, you know, and I, I always wanted to have that being known as an individual thing was always, I don't know why, was really important to me. And I happened to be <laughs> a little bit of a know-it-all. I love knowing the answer to stuff. And so I'd be sitting in class and, you know, the teacher would be going, yeah, so who knows what I go, oh, oh, I know, and, you know. And so one of my girlfriends started calling me Tootie after Officer Tootie in car 54, where are you? Because he was always going, oh, 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 okay. And I thought, cool. And I was kind of just started hanging with this uh, little clique of friends who were the, you know, the oddball artistic types. And um, so uh, anyway, so I was, was thrilled and they all started calling me Tootie and it just stuck from there. And um, when we were going to the folk singer, it was one of my, my best girlfriends, um, uh, was the one who talked me into going there. And uh, so that's what she called me. And so when Fred met me, he called me Tootie and everybody there called me Tootie and I've always, it's just stuck. <laughs> Everyone in my family calls me Tootie. The only one was my mother who just passed away about uh, almost a year ago now. And uh, when she was about 90, she goes, is it okay if I, if I start calling you Kathleen again, <laughs> I go, Mom, do whatever you want. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of been, it's kind of been my business persona mm -hmm. and Tootie's everything else. Yeah. <laughs> um, I read somewhere that because you were into Joan, ba into Joan Baez that you like got an acoustic guitar. Yeah, I did. One Christmas, I think I was 16, 15 or 16. I wanted, you know, that's all I wanted for Christmas. And so my folks got me one. And, you know, not knowing what the hell's going on. Anyway, they got my, my hands are pretty small, which is why that box bass I played was so perfect. It's got this skinny little neck. So they got me a classical guitar, which has got the super wide neck on it. And it was just, uh, I don't know, I just, it just wasn't me. I just couldn't do it. That's why I went, once I, Fred actually talked me into learning how to play bass, it was like, oh, this is it. This is it. No chords, no, you know. 
I love it. And there's a certain power in the instrument that, that just wasn't there for, for me with guitar. Um, what were your kind of, did you have like expectations for yourself um, after high school or as a young person or teenager? What, what were your kind of plans after high school? I, I really am, I'm, I'm, I'm what we call a floater. I kind of had no clue um, really what I, what my ambition was other than to, you know, to go to college and maybe get a teaching credential and blah, 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 you know, the usual, but above and beyond that, no. And um, I just kind of always felt like what I was meant to do was just gonna come and be in my way and that would be it. And it would make the decision for me. I'm kind of a bit of a fatalist. <laughs> So you, so, you uh, said that you did go to college and you ended up dropping out. Well, yeah, maybe yeah. maybe for six months, if right. that. Maybe you know, part of one semester. Yeah. And you know, again, that's when I first met Fred and we started hanging out. And it was like, no, I've got to go to school. I got to go to work. Yeah, just you know, blow it off. He got me fired from my job. Got me out of school. <laughs> I was like, but that's the best thing that ever happened to me. So you know, what what the hell? Well, I was gonna say that's the, the thing that came into your life. Now there like, it was. He was in my <laughs> way. <laughs> Big time. Um, okay, so you met Fred at your job. Were you a... I went, met him at the Folk Singer. Okay. Um, uh, they were actually driving up to Canada to avoid the draft and ran out of gas in Portland and asked some girl on the street if there was any place they could play for gas money. And he sent them to this coffee house called the Folk Singer. And uh, they went up and auditioned for the guy who ran the place, Whitey Davis. And they were this kind of raucous, raw, um, early Rolling Stones looking band yeah. with the sound to match. And he was like, whoa, nobody. And they were playing a bunch of songs by Love who um, nobody had ever heard of in Portland, um, just in California. And, uh, and so he was just incredibly impressed and uh, hired him on the spot. They became the house band and ended up being their manager for several years after that. But, uh, so yeah, I just saw him the first time when they were performing one of the, one of the nights and just like, okay. And uh, was just kind of like, yeah, whatever. I'm not the kind of girl, that, I wasn't the kind of girl that guys, you know, go, oh my God. You know, it was just kind of like in the background. <laughs> Never thought he would even notice me, let alone, you know. But yeah, What kind of meant to be. girl were you? Very shy. Very you said straight, you were tomboy. All very, uh, yeah, tomboy. Very, um, um, not prissy, but what do I want to say? Scared of getting involved sexually with anyone. <laughs> you know, very like, guys, shit. I don't know how to handle them. You know, didn't date. Basically, just worked a lot. Loved money. Loved making money. So. So then, how did? Uh, what was your? How did your relationship progress? If you you saw it Fred was and you were just. Like, I mean, we, that's another thing we should talk about a lot. It was one of those, oh, I don't want to say love at first sight because that's so trite, but it was pretty much true. He always said the first time that he saw me, I had this aura that he could see around me, <laughs> like a halo or something. And, and he was just incredibly drawn to me. And he was just persistent, didn't give up. And... Um, it just, I don't know, we just fell into each other's lives and it seemed so normal and natural mm -hmm. that within about a week or two, anytime anybody that we knew saw one of us and not the other would go, oh, where's Fred? Where's Tootie? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was in, was that 67? That was 60, the end of 66 when we first met. Okay. Um, when you started, ha when did you start having kids? Was that like a conscious decision that you wanted? To do, like <laughs> Back then, without birth control, are you yeah, out of your mind? Know. Please. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was like, hey, that's what happens. Oh, really? Uh, I didn't even hear about birth control until after Whedon was born. Seriously, and um, you know that's why they're so close together. Um, but uh, you know. Uh, Shane was a conscious decision, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it was just you know that's what happened. We got together, 
you know, couldn't stay away from each other, and that's that's what happened. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and what at what point uh, you left the country for a little bit? Um, oh, when we went up to the Yukon, you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So wasn't that was like pretty soon after you guys met, wasn't it? Uh, well, kind years? of. I mean, Amanda was. Uh, about three, and Whedon was about a year and a half old. It was, I'm actually going to make a trip. It's going to be 50 years this next year, in 2020. We were up there in 1970. So, and so, and we got married in 67. So it was, you know, two and a half, three years after, after we were married. But yeah, um, we actually were headed up to, um, his grandmother at the time lived, um, um, up in Alaska, outside of Spinard, I think it was. And we were actually on our way up there. He always wanted to become a pilot, and he had um, taken pilot, pilot training and whatnot when he was like 16 in Vegas. And um, so he wanted to go up there and said, screw me. He was one of his things where, that's it, screw music, I'm done. I'm done, I'm going to become a bush pilot. Let's go to Alaska. Let's all of our stuff, put the kids in the car, and let's go. I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Another adventure, here we go. <laughs> So we made it up there and whatever, and we actually went up with uh, uh, Tim Roxon and his wife, who was the, uh, the drummer from the Lollipop Shop, the Weeds. And um, they ended up turning around and coming back, but we just kept going and ended up breaking down outside a white horse and met this one couple up there um, who really helped us out and told us that you could homestead up there and blah, 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 met all these people that were really cool and ended up you know, marking out a hundred acres of, of, uh, of land, went in and registered and went out there, pitched a tent, blah, 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 started building the cabin and, you know, all the rest of it. And we're up there for, <clears throat> I don't know, about eight months, I think. And then it was really close to Christmas and uh, I was homesick as hell, I, you know, really close to my family, especially when I was younger. And so he surprised me one day we were going into town and said, yeah, let's just go home for Christmas. What the hell? So we did. Drove all the way back to Portland and we're here for, I don't know, about a week or so. And then when we went to go back up there, go across the border, the Canadian official said, no, you, you lied to us. You were just supposed to just be going through Canada. You were going to Alaska and you're obviously trying to avoid the draft, which was untrue because Fred was finally off their roster since he had two kids, blah, blah, blah. But um, so they wouldn't let us come back across. So we just wrote to our friends and said, hey, whatever's there, go get it, which is the way things work up there. And, uh, but I'm curious as hell at some point to, you know, to make that drive. It was the Alcan, Alcan when we went. It was like all gravel road and, you know, uh, nothing there. <laughs> you know, miles and miles and miles of nothing before you hit any kind of civilization. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm curious to go back I if and see what White Horse is like, see if, if it's grown, if it's changed, if I can even find this place again that we had. It was by this place called Fox Lake, which I haven't been able to locate on any maps. It was obviously not big enough to be on, on a, you know, any of the maps I've seen. But um, you know, like I say, I'm really, really curious to go back and see it again. <laughs> what did You said you're really close to your family. Um, what did they think about... You're, you know, you and Fred and your life and you're kind of like Well, my dad's first reaction was, what? <laughs> um, you know, my dad was like, you know, well, both my folks were very straight. Um, but Fred won my dad over just from talking to him. Once he started talking to him and, and the hair didn't become such a big thing, um, he realized that as far as Fred's responsibility, his values and everything else was spot on with how I had been raised and who I was. My mother, God lover, was, um, uh, must have come to my defense a lot <laughs> because she, you know, pretty much made sure everything was cool and, um, and uh, just really liked Fred right from the get-go or, or just, I don't know, maybe, I think moms do this thing where they, they really know if you seriously are truly in love with someone and that's kind of all they really want for any of your kids is to be that happy. So when you came back to Portland, what was your kind of plan to like survive, make a living? Oh, you want to think we had plans. No. This, ours was not a planning lifestyle. Um, 
it was just kind of, Fred was an amazing person. He would come up with in a plan in a day, and that would be your life for the next three years. Um, and it wasn't really a plan. It was just like, oh, okay, well, yeah, let's do this, let's do that. Um, let me think. So we're talking 70, just before she was born. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, we came back, and the guitar player from the Weeds, Ed Bowen, happened to have moved back into Portland in the meantime while we were gone. And he and Fred got together and started their first guitar shop <laughs> with nothing. And um, to the point to where they would, uh, Fred would go out and buy old appliances, fix them up. He used, had the, they, had the, they called it Freedom Guitar. So he had this thing for getting old washing machines and painting them red, white, and blue. Putting them in the shop with a few guitars and a little bit of this and that. And after, God, just a few months, six months or so, they had that place hopping. It was, it was the first, uh, you know, cool music store in town. Everything else was, you know, like this old style, you know, piano is God kind of music stores, you know, that, and everybody was just coming of age. We were right around 20, I think, ourselves then, 2021. 20, and um, so everybody wanted to learn how to play guitar. So it was, they just, just took off like crazy from there for those guys until they started fighting like crazy and the whole thing blew up. And, oh, know, that's hey, what happened? But, oh, yeah, yeah. They, 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 um, Fred, Fred and Ed just couldn't get, they always had this kind of um, strange relationship. Best friends, but um, still just, you know, at it, you know I, I don't even know how to explain it. But anyway, Ed uh, um, ended up keeping the shop. Him, he and his, his younger brother, who was one of the partners there, and um, and Fred, you know, just took off. Kind of gave him, just gave it all up. Whatever he did that a lot. Gave it all up, and we moved to L.A. so we could make it. You know. <laughs> Wait, you moved to L.A.? Oh God, yeah, we moved to L.A. several times. <laughs> we were gypsies that at that particular point, big okay. time. Yeah, we went down to L.A. Um, and stayed there for a bit. Came back here. Let me think. I have to get my timeline right here. Yeah, after Freedom Guitar uh, blew up, we had Shane. I was pregnant in the, when they first started that particular store. And then, uh, yeah, we moved down to L.A. And Fred started uh, auditioning people. And, you know, was just going to go back. To, well, he was always a lead singer. So he was just lead singing. And uh, got a bunch of guys together down there and auditioned them. And we were down there for, God, I don't know, about a year and a half. And um, just could never get anything, yeah. you know, to last, to work, to, you know. Uh, L.A.'s not the town to, to go and do that in. Everybody thought it was at the time, but <laughs> it really wasn't. And, um, and he just ended up doing a lot of weird stuff. It's why you'll hear it in a lot of his lyrics. Uh, he went through a a pretty bitter time of feeling like it was never going to happen for him and his songs would never be appreciated and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, just doing a solo act for uh, quite a bit of time, doing acoustic stuff. Um, and then he um, got together after we were in the Yukon with one of the other band members from the Weeds, um, the rhythm guitar player, and they did kind of a Seals and Croft kind of uh, acoustic song stuff and a lot of songs that he wrote were about our adventures up in the Yukon and uh, just we just did all kinds of crazy stuff yeah. it was it was a blast <laughs> it was not boring <laughs> um, but uh, all right so I just I don't know if I have this like some stuff might be out of order no oh, I'm sure it probably okay. is but I, I might be speaking out of order too <laughs> I mean, um, you're talking over 50 years yeah, yeah, here, so come on, <laughs> give me a break, okay? <laughs> um, well, I guess I'm really curious, like, so moved back at some point and started Captain Wiz Eagles. Captain Wiz Eagles we did when we came back from L.A. Um, and um, the second time, which, whatever, same kind of thing happened, whatever. Um, yeah, we started Captain Wiz Eagles uh, in 74, and then when did, so you started playing 
in the in the rats, right? Yeah, that's around when you, like, 77, to, 78, end okay. of 77 sometime. Yeah. Um, I mean, had you ever considered... Oh, hell no. Pl okay, so this was just Fred <laughs> being like... Fred goes, that's it, I'm starting to... Um, well, actually, what, the, what, what happened was he was playing in a band um, with uh, Stan and my brother Pat, who's the drummer, um, and because um, Pat was working at Wiz Eagles with us, and they were doing a band called King Bee, and they actually got a shot playing with the Ramones here in Portland at, um, at, the, at the Paramount, that's the one they call the Schnitz now, and uh, on a bill with Tom Petty, because Mick DeVille canceled, and somebody called him at last minute, and after seeing the Ramones and seeing just the you know, they were kind of, because King Bee was kind of playing this swampy, dirgy, kind of bluesy kind of stuff. And after he saw the Ramones, he was just like, oh, I got to get in a band with some energy. This is, you know, whatever. And he was just all hopped up and worked up about it. And, he's, and he was thinking about who he could, you know, get together in this band. And, and he wanted to start playing guitar. He had it with just, you know, just being a lead singer. So he was really teaching himself before he only knew a few chords just to write songs with. So he pretty much uh, is, well, he is complete, was completely self-taught on guitar. And uh, so he said, hey, I don't know how to play guitar. You don't, I, I'm sick of all these stupid bass players. They're flaky as hell. I'm going to teach you how to play bass. And I went, yeah, okay, whatever, right. You know, having a music store, we had too many instruments around. So I was like, <laughs> and this one guy was coming in all the time who was, happened to be born the same year, 1948, as Fred and I. And he'd never played before either, and he was dying to learn how to play drums. So Fred said, perfect, we got a band. It's called The Rats. None of us know how to play. We're going to play punk rock. It's easy, it's simple. We, we got this. It's cool. And that's how it started. <laughs> I thought he'd give up after two weeks, and, you know, you know, and the wild hair would be gone. But oh, no. You know, I was like, okay. And then once I you know, got in there and, and started you know, doing it, it was, it was cool. I mean, I was still nervous as shit on stage and you know really introverted and whatever all through the rats pretty much and um but you know once we ended up getting dead moon together uh, there was i don't know i was, had just put in enough time and it was we took a bit of a break and there was something about andrew it was magic he was just it was just the chemistry was there and it was just it was fun you know, whereas the rats for me was a little bit, because um, the kids were still pretty young, was, uh, it was just conflicting, you know. Yeah, I want people to pulling me in every which direction, you know, as a woman, you know, it's just, that's our lot in life, what can I say? <laughs> you know, so, but by the time that, that Dead Moon came around, I was ready, the world was ready, Fred was ready, Andrew was ready, and it was just um, the perfect storm. Mm. It really was. Um, how did you guys fit into, like, the Portland music scene at the time? Did you? Did you? Oh, we were all, like, a major part of it. We, well, I feel like Fred and I have been a part of the, the Portland music scene since, you know, since the 60s, in the late 60s, off and on at different points. And um, we just happened to own, you know, a music store downtown where we sold super cheap instruments and really encouraged kids to pick up an instrument and play and blah, blah, blah. And we're about oh, 10 to 15 years older than all the kids involved in, you know, are wanting to get involved in the scene at that particular point. Some of them were still high school kids, you know, um, with all the early punk rock bands here in Portland. And so we just happened to be one component um, that fit in. Uh, we had the responsibility aspect and, you know, uh, to help get a venue going and ha be able to, you know, sign a lease and the landlord wouldn't go, well, who are you guys? You know, you know, just there was a bunch of different people that made the scene actually come alive and happen in Portland. And we just happened to be um, one component of it. But I've always felt like I'm a huge part of whatever scene because I've always been involved with all the people that are making it happen yeah. in several different times here in town. Um, and can, can you just talk a little bit about opening Tombstone Music or starting Tombstone Music? Yeah, we, we were downtown for... Uh, the original store we had for about a year and a half on Grand Avenue, and then we moved to a bigger place downtown in the Deacon Building. 
um, and we were there till the end of 85. And at that point, um, my brother Pat was our partner, and um, he really wanted to make a lot of changes to the store downtown and dress it up and make it look like Apple Music or you know any you know any real music store. And of course, Fred loves lo-fi, down low, holes in the carpets, tape on the walls, give it a name, you know, real. So it became a big conflict. And we were t actually, um, um, you know, Dead Moon was, uh, well, where were we? That was 85. So that was actually right before we started Dead Moon. That's right. And we were out here, which is clear the hell from downtown, <laughs> obviously. And, um, and he was getting pretty sick of, you know, because we'd, you know, get the kids off to school, go in and work till, you know, six or seven, come home, fix dinner, get the kids settled in, usually go and drive all the way back downtown to rehearse, and, you know, and six days a week. <laughs> I was like, ah! So uh, anyway, he just decided we just split up the partnership and, um, you know, we each picked different instruments and just split all the merchandise and whatever. Pat stayed downtown and we found a, found a place out here in Clackamas closer to home and just started um, a music store, just the two of us, and wanted at that point just to keep it the two of us. And, um, and so that was kind of the tail end of the rats and everything else, and that was when he, we happened. Everything just kind of snowballed together, and we just kind of came up with the idea of, uh, he just goes, man, I just want to get back to, back to my roots, back to basic rock and roll, um, you know, whatever, just start, start out playing covers, which is what we did, nothing but covers. And... Um, just a great way to kind of uh, get get a feel for each other, get a, you know, and uh, just played some really funky, funky gigs, and um, you know, got got um, Dead Moon happening shortly after that, mm. and uh, you know, um, what, what would you say are some of the challenges and benefits of being? I mean, you guys are just the like pinnacle of DIY independent <laughs> music it's in the blood. creation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, I would imagine there are upsides to that, but then I would imagine that there are also challenges. Yeah. Well, you know, you're never going to make it big, big, big. You're never going to be Nirvana. You're never going to be, um, you know, which, which is fine. I, I don't think either one of us, I know I probably couldn't deal with that. I don't think he could either. We got really lucky to be um, renowned enough to satisfy us both up to here and yet maintain an, an anonymity to the level to where you still have a life and you have a multifaceted life. It's not just music. It's not just the band. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have no complaints. It, you know, it really worked out amazingly well. As far as the DIY thing, um, that's just something that we would have done either way. Um, at first, it was more about getting the control over a finished product or, you know, just ha having stuff the way you wanted it. Um, and a lot of it was economic, of course, just because, you know, and, and a lot of it was just not having to depend on somebody else. We both always hated that, having to wait around for somebody else to uh, decide they wanted to do your record or, you know, any, any of that kind of stuff. So that's a lot of the reasons. And luckily, having the music store, we had the capital, um, we had the funds available to be able to do that. So we were lucky in that aspect where a lot of bands... Um, aren't, you know, um, or have to, you know, put all their money in a pool from all their gigs to put out their first record, which is awesome. I love that. And I know a lot of bands do that, still do that, um, which is great because um, it's just, uh, it's something no one can ever take away from you. To have that in your hand and just go, I did this. You know, it's just this amazing feeling. It's just, ah, it's incredible. So um, I'm really happy that there's, there's still people that are still willing to make those sacrifices um, to make their dreams happen. And you kind of need to do that, but you can't really count on somebody else doing it for you. Yeah. Um, what was your role in Dead Moon as a musician, and then what was your role as kind of like business person? Oh, business? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> all the book work, all the logistics, all the bookings. All <laughs> well, at first, not. I mean, at first, which was cool. At first, other people did all that stuff for us, which was awesome because we didn't have a clue. And, um, you know, we had an amazing tour manager, um, uh, Edwin Heath, uh, from Holland. And all of our stuff was based out of Holland, our, our booking agency, our car rental, um, uh, European label, you know, the whole nine yards. So, um, so, and he was a great teacher. And at some point when he wanted to be off the road and started having kids and blah, 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 then we took over to managing ourselves because we knew how to do it and we'd been every place before and, you know, still had somebody booking us and whatever. But at that point then, um, you know, luckily in Europe anyway, um, you know, the venues are the ones that deal with making, making your accommodations happen and the this and the that and blah, blah, blah. So it was pretty much just all the road stuff. Fred did all the driving, you know, I did all the navigating. This is before GPS. <coughs> and I'm not the best navigator. Um, but, uh, you know, anyway, so we did all that, all that stuff uh, by ourselves uh, on, on, later, on later tours. And then in the U.S., I would do the, the whole thing, you know, book all the hotels and blah, 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 because you have to, in the U.S., you have to do it on your own. And, uh, but as far as a musician, um, me and Andrew were just kind of the glue that held everything together and just kept hammering at you. <laughs> <laughs> Power. Um, and, uh, you know, we each had our own unique personalities that just... Uh, really connected with people on different levels. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. You probably can explain that better than I can. <laughs> I mean, what I think of, you know, <laughs> I mean, a lot of people ask me those kind of questions, yeah. and it's like, I know in my head kind of what everything felt like, and, but I know it's kind of different for the audience and for, and for the fans. Andrew just had this amazing uh, way of making people feel at ease. And bringing them into the fold. Yeah, come to mom and meet, meet, you know, meet mom and dad, you know. And, uh, and it had that kind of family feel. Fred and I were 13 years older than Andrew. So he, and he's born the same year as my youngest brother, okay. So he always had that little brother feel for me and Fred. And, um, so, and he just brought this uh, life in the moment quality to it. Um, Fred brought in the whole uni universality of his lyrics, uh, emotions, passion, um, and an amazing stage presence. Um, and for me, I think I kind of was um, always the one people could relate to the most. If they were going to have a kid, like I, I still, one of my favorite moments is uh, we had played a show, I think it was as Pierce Darrow's later, um, we had a show up in Seattle in this dinky little club called the Fun House and Eddie Vedder's happened to be home or in town and he came in and I'm the one that he had to tell his, Olivia had just been born and he had a daughter. That was my, my role to people. You know, I was the, the mom. <laughs> the best friend, the confidant, the, you know. Um, and, and uh, you know, and, and the other aspect, too, um, that I, I, I came to kind of understand later was um, just how many younger girls kind of gave me this mentoring kind of role and um, um, saw the strength in me. And by doing that, they saw the strength in themselves. Um, your, this is probably going to sound... <laughs> I like, feel like I know what you're going to say to this. Okay. <laughs> well, good. Okay. You do it. <laughs> the, um, like the way that you guys stood on stage, your kind of overall aesthetic, the candle, the Jim Beam bottle, you stood on stage next to each other, mm -hmm. not in front. Was that, uh, was that conscious? Was that deliberate? It was conscious on Fred's part. And, uh, and this is going to sound funny, but most of it was just to have that... Um, that close contact to where you can feel the vibe, the electricity that's going between the three of you. Part of it was just pure practicality so that Fred could hear what Andrew was doing and that Andrew could hear what he was doing. And, and it just became, we actually, I think, 
even got more and more tighter as time went on and it just felt right. You know, it was just, uh, it was just a way for us to really feed off of, off of one another. Mm. And uh, the candle, all the, all the ritualistic things just happened out of spontaneous events, <laughs> which is what's really cool that they weren't planned, okay? Even the setup wasn't planned. Um, except for the point that Fred said, yeah, I'm, I'm done with having the, you know, the drummer way in the back. You know, I want to have Andrew up to the front of the stage and Andrew, the showboat that he is, is like, fuck yeah, let's go, right, you know? Um, so that wasn't a problem for him. For a lot of guys who went, what? No, I can't do that. Um, so it just, it just worked for, for all of us. But, uh, I mean, even the candles, a funny bit, because um, Andrew played an old Ludwig kit and he actually had a rack tom on, on the kit for the first couple of tours. And one of the first tours, he goes, I'm taking this damn thing off. I never hit the damn thing anyway. And he pulled it off, and there's a, he's in the lug rig, there's a big hole in the top of the, the drum. And we were playing some gig, and our, my, our son Whedon um, was on tour with us. He used to do our merchandise when he was in his early 20s. And... Uh, <laughs> and we were in Europe and just like, oh, we were like teenagers, man. It was crazy because they'd, they'd give you anything you wanted. We'd go, sure, we want a bottle of Jack every night. Fine, they give you a bottle of Jack every night. We had crates in our van full of fucking booze that we hadn't even drank yet. And one night, Whedon's walking around and took a last swig of Jack or something and turned the bottle upside down and put it in Andrew's drum. And Andrew just left it there. And then on another night, he, he, he's the one that got the candle trip on there. And I don't even know why he did that. He, he still couldn't remember when I asked him about it. <laughs> it just became a thing. And he thought, oh, oh that's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> Total accident. So then we couldn't get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I do. So you said your son, Whedon, went on tour with you. Um, were, you were your kids more like okay with your lives as musicians after the rats and when you're doing dead moon because i know you said mm, you know whedon's really the only one that was super involved yeah. with what we were ever doing in in music um you know um i don't think shane understands it at all <laughs> he's very straight he works for the irs by the way um so um which is which is wonderful. I I love that your kids can have their own individual things going on, and it has nothing to do with you. That's the way it should be. And um, Amanda really loves our accomplishments and what we've done, and um, she loves to get up and sing every once in a while herself. Um, so she, you know, is very supportive of it, um, but hasn't really been involved like that. You know, yeah. Um, can you, so how did, you talked about that you and Fred grew up with this kind of insane work ethic. Mm -hmm. Um, how did that work ethic translate in Dead Moon, um, as musicians, as touring musicians? Like, how often did you play? How often did you tour? What was your work as, schedule As like? much as possible, but a, a lot of the work ethic involved and some of it was just personal experience. Was It was a big thing for me and Fred to listen to all the opening acts, every show that we played, unless we were doing an interview or something else like that. And to uh, hang out for a while after concerts and sign stuff for people and just be available. That was kind of part of the gig, you know. And... Uh, Sometimes it was tedious, sometimes you were really up for it, and sometimes you're like, oh, God, you know, but you do. Because for, for the people that come to that particular concert, that's a once-in-a-year event for them. It's not like, oh, God, this is number 60, and some of the tours we did were horrendously long, longer than we should have done. But, um, you know, so, and it just, uh, you know, the only thing that it didn't translate, Fred hated rehearsing. We all hated rehearsing. So we would just, and he loved the spontaneity of having stuff fresh. And he always had an argument with any other musicians that he ever played with who wanted to rehearse stuff to death and have it spot on, perfect, note for note by the time they got on stage. To him, that was the most boring music anybody could ever play. 
It was sterile. There was no life to it. There was no passion to it. So we would basically just get together and, you know, especially if, you know, one of us or all of us didn't call practice off, which we did a lot. And uh, basically just get the song together enough to where we know, knew the parts and it became what it became on stage. <laughs> just still. I don't, know. I don't think my band would sound like that if it yeah. <laughs> Worked for us, thank yeah. God. Yeah, kids. This doesn't yeah. mean. Like I hate the studio work. even more, just so you know. Oh, God. Oh, I, okay, that was the other. Uh. I wanted to ask you about the recording process in Dead Moon. Mm hmm. Um, where did you record? How did how did you record? Oh, we you recorded get, you all over the place. We recorded in the store. We recorded here in the house. We recorded one of the albums with me in the bathroom upstairs you just used with my bass amp in the tub because he'd heard that Billy Childish or somebody had done that. Um, we experimented with all kinds of weird stuff. But a lot of the recordings we did here in the house um, and, uh, you know, just... Did Fred engineer everything? He was the... Pretty much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> insane. I mean, because your, your output is, like, sort of insane, too. Well, it was, and, and, and again, I mean, it, we, it was such a big thing for us to be touring in Europe, and at that particular point, uh, the booking agency would go, well, I need a new album for us to book a tour. So, you know, so, you know, every year a new album had to come out, you know, so that you could, uh, you know, book a tour and, uh, and, and tour the album. So that was, that was a big part of it too, was that push to always more and more and more. And um, touring in Europe and putting albums out once a year and being independent, were you able to make money and like support yourselves kind of with the We band? probably could have. I mean, Fred and I were in, luckily in a position that we didn't have to. Um, Andrew did, you know, we'd kind of bank and dole out his money for him so he wouldn't go through it in two months, but, <laughs> you know, and would pretty much last him, you know, for the, for the year because he was, didn't want to have to do anything else on the side. And it was awesome to see him at least be able to make a living, you know, yeah. keeping alive, just playing music, you know. Um, that's why I love in the documentary and is doing his bit. And that's true to with his mom talking about, well, they're hiring at the Dairy Queen. But mom, I got a job. <laughs> you know, she just never got it. She was very sweet, too. But uh, but yeah, it was just all he ever wanted to do. All he ever thought he was good at, you know. And uh, so it was really cool. He was able to do that. We could have, I mean, as you know, I mean, we used to live you know, for many, many years on next to nothing. So we could have done it. It was just that we needed more in our lives than that. We're, you know, got to be doing something all the time. So, you know, let's go. Let's do Let's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> let's start a store. Let's do this. Let's do that. You know, so that's uh, kind of was more just that uh, Fred and I needed, needed that. Mm. And still do I still feel like I'm operating a store still doing the website so it's like it's cool yeah you know, I was do. on yeah. looking at it the other day I was like oh, more stuff out here. yeah um so Dead Moon broke up in 2006 mm -hmm. um what kind of what led to the the breakup honestly now that he's gone um Andrew just started getting too fucked up and um, it's really weird. When he hit 45, the age thing really <laughs> came down for him. Um, I don't know why. And he started getting a bit bitter, which was so unlike him. Mm. And instead of joking with people being very cruel to them, you know, sarcastically cruel. <laughs> and, um, and it was sad to see and sad to watch. And um, Fred had just had it. And so unfortunately, I tried to talk him out of it naturally, but that didn't work. I just was one of those things that was so amazing in my life. I never wanted to see it come to an end. Um, and it was only, I don't know, about six months um, went by. Um, and then we started Pure Steros, which was pretty much a continuation of just all the songs that he'd been writing at the tail end of, uh, of Dead Moon. And uh, pretty much just picked up from there. And uh, 
we did really well, and I really enjoyed playing in that band, and we did a lot of good material and um, put a couple albums out. Um, it just never quite had the the chemistry that Dead Moon did. Mm. No, yeah, I love Pierce Darrow yeah. too, but yeah. Um, was there any like bitterness when it when it ended? Did Andrew know that that was? Why? Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, we kind of kept our distance for, you know, for a few months. But, yeah, I mean, um, I love Andrew. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was not an issue. We always saw each other and kept in touch. Oh, okay. And, and, uh, and we're always friends. Yeah, that was no big deal. It was just part of who he was mm -hmm. and um, just his way of dealing with stuff he couldn't handle. We all have some, something. Yep, <laughs> there you go. Except me. I'm yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and perfect in every way. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. <laughs> um, I read this quote uh, from Fred from an interview in 2000. He said, do everything together, work together, play together. If you can't stand to be with somebody 24 hours a day, you got the wrong person. Seriously. Yeah, that's what we both believe. <laughs> that's how we live. And honestly, that was pretty much it from, you know, yeah. from the time I was 17, <laughs> 17, 18. Um, can you, uh, or like whatever you're kind of willing to talk about, um, Fred's illness and sort of your, your life since um, his his passing? Yeah. Um, it's really funny. We used to talk a lot. Well, we used to just talk a lot, period. I mean, all the time. And one of the things that always stuck in his head was when we still had our uh, Captain Wizzigals downtown, he happened to see this little old couple dressed to the nines walking arm in arm down the street. He always wanted that to be us at some point. And he always kind of expected to live a long time. Um, his dad, his grandfathers, both his grandfathers, you know, lived way up into their 80s. And he kind of always thought that he would have that much time. And when he turned 60, we did the Portland Marathon, which was awesome that we have that accomplishment to tick off on the old roster, uh, bucket list, whatever. Um, which was something that really meant a lot to him. And it was hard for us to do because we were training while <laughs> we were touring, okay, if you can imagine. And um, so that was cool. And then when he turned about 62, it was almost like, you know, this kind of domino effect happened. And he first got anemia really bad and just felt wiped out, but he kind of had dealt with that off and on at different points in his life. And um, then we later found out that he, at some point on one of the Pierce Darrow's tours, had basically had a heart attack that we didn't even know about, or that he just, he walked off. I mean, we, when we thought about it, we go, yeah, it was when I pulled the car over and I was feeling really weird and got out and walked around the car three times and said, okay, good to go. Got back in and drove on. So... Um, <laughs> Very much old school. Yeah, walk it off, whatever. Um, so um, we found out later that um, um, he, his, uh, in his heart, the, the back artery was completely 100% blocked. And that, and that was from this older heart attack. And that the other two were like 80% blocked. And this is after we found out that he had prostate cancer. We were actually down in Loma Linda so he could get radiation treatments. And uh, they found that out, and that's when he had to go and have open heart surgery and have a uh, triple bypass. And so recovered from that, and uh, everything seemed cool, and we, you know, we're back playing again, and blah blah blah. And then um, he found out because they they keep track after you do the radiation of what's going on, and they found out that his. Um, his, you know, prostate cancer had come back, that the radiation hadn't gotten everything. So we got on a couple of different programs, you know, um, where they were doing um, um, what they call chemical chemo, whatever. Anyway, it's all these pills and stuff that basically suppress everything. And that worked for a long time. And uh, then at one point they were doing all these scans, and at one point 
they found out that a little bit of it had gotten to his bone. And um, we're thinking, yeah, okay, whatever. And they kept doing it. It was stayed the same and stayed the same and stayed the same. So we thought, okay, it's just, you know, it's all cool. And then um, uh, the last tour that we did, and thank God we did, with, with the duo, we went back and we went to um, Australia, New Zealand, and played Japan for the first time. And he'd always had that as a big thing in his head, that he always wanted to play Japan. We played a couple shows in Tokyo. And then after that, uh, which really wore him down, it was, you know, like he was just starting to get really tired fast um, all the time. And uh, we ended up doing the last tour in Europe with the duo. And by the time we got through that last show and we'd taken the rental car back to the airport, and you've been in enough airports, you already know, okay, how far it is to walk and this and that. And he was just completely pale and exhausted. And, and he just came to the point, he goes, Tootie, I got to sit down. I can't walk another step. And I got him sat down. And naturally, we were running late. I had to get a hold of one of the, um, uh, the ladies at the customer counter or whatever. And they had to get him a wheelchair and go through a special path and blah, 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 and kind of do this, you know, almost bypass security kind of a thing to get us on the plane to get back home in time. And when they got him up there, he still had to climb some stairs to get into the plane and then to walk clear to the back. And he, he stopped several times and was leaning against stuff. And the stewardess was like, I don't think we can let him fly. Are you sure he's going to be okay? Blah, blah, blah. And he was just like, to get me back there and get me home or I'm never going to get out of here. I'm like, okay, okay. And so I talked him into letting him go. And we made it home and had, had him, they had a, a, a wheelchair arranged for um, on the other end. I got him home got him to, into the doctor and they did a, um, had to do a biopsy and found out that the cancer had spread to his bone marrow. I'm like, fuck. This is in the spring of, of 17. And so at that point, then he had to um, agree to chemo, chemo. And um, so we started chemo, regular chemotherapy and Slowly lost all of his hair. <laughs> like, oh, God, you know. And he told me later, he goes, Ghost Tootie, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have even gone through that. He would have just been, he was, you know, he was never afraid of death. Talked about it a lot. And um, a f really a firm believer that we come around again and that we'll find each other again, and that we have several times in our various lifetimes. This one's been the best, I think. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and uh, like I say, it was really amazing and so cool that, um, that this Dead Moon Night thing happened in October. And literally two weeks after that, I think on the 13th of October, um, he just started feeling really weird again. And uh, the doctor told him that basically the chemo had already done as much as it was going to do. And um, I don't know, shortly after that, he had an episode where he got out of bed. I was helping him, got out of bed and just collapsed to the floor. And he goes, I can't get up. I had to call the ambulance guys. And they came out and put him in one of those chairs to get him downstairs and put him to the hospital and that's when they found out that everything had just spread spread to his liver and you know all the rest of it and um was in the hospital for about a week and then um, um they put him in hospice and at first he was trying to tell me he goes Tootie just put me in a home somewhere I don't want you to have to deal with any of this stuff and I'm like are you out of your mind you know, no way, I'm not letting that happen. And you're in no position to stop me, okay? <laughs> so brought him home and um, had a whole thing set up here. And he spent the last couple of weeks of his life here. And um, saw the kids, saw everybody that meant anything to him, came out, saw him, and, uh, which was really cool. And uh, 
they put him on, you know, quite a bit of morphine at the end, and uh, the very last day was pretty gnarly, and I called one of the nurses to help, and our, our friend Greg was here, and um, they came and helped administer part of this morphine dose and whatever, and um, I was supposed to give him another dose um, at 9 o'clock that night, and he'd been really agitated, you know, during the day, and um, he was just pleasant and, you know, finally, had, you know, settled down and, and was sleeping, and I went to give him medication, and he was cold. So I had to, you know, call the nurses and, and all that stuff, but he had this amazing smile on his face, and when the nurse came out, she goes, you know, he looks like he's just had the most amazing dream in his life, which was the other thing we used to always talk about, was that when you go, you, your movie would play of your whole life, and you'd be able to see it all. And I think that's what happened for him, which was so cool. <laughs> really amazing, but yeah. Amazing life. Yeah. No regrets. And I know he. And I know. And I know. And I know. I know he didn't have any either. So and thank God we got we had fifty years together. And what an amazing time it was. <laughs> um, what What have you been doing? Can you still play music? Do you have any interests? I can, but for me, like I've been telling a lot of different people, for me, it's a team sport. And with Andrew and Fred both gone, you know, it's just not the same for me. And it's, um, you know, I've had a blast going up and kind of guest singing with different bands, you know, over the last couple of years. But I kind of always had it in my head, this 70 years old and I'm done, um, which I turned last December. So, um, you know, I, I don't really plan on, on doing anything else. You know, I, I you know, kind of feel like my 70th birthday party, that was my, my swan song. I did just one thing after that where they had um, a thing they do here in town with these kids that all go to a, um, um, oh, it's really cool music school, and they basically have a band recital, and they happen this year to be doing nothing but um, songs from different bands in the Northwest. So Dead Moon happened to be one of them. So I got up there and sang uh, Dead Moon Night with these kids. Jerry A was there and got up and sang one of the Poison Idea songs with them. And one of the guys from the Decemberists was there uh, playing the drummer, played drums on one of their songs. And they did, you know, Nirvana and, the, you, know, you know, all this different stuff. But there was a bunch of us local that they'd asked to... Um, to come and uh, was really cool. I, and again, it's always been such a big thing to encourage kids. And here's these kids, some of them are like, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old and just amazing already, you know, but just to encourage kids to, uh, to love music and, um, and have an outlet for it. And uh, so I was really cool and it just felt like, yeah, that's a, that's a fitting end. Yep. That's the way it should be. You know, like I've told, you know, uh, and I happened to come across, um, a thing that Fred wrote, um, and uh, it just hit home. And it was something like, I've got it in the other room. I've had my time, it's your turn now. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> um, okay, well, I just have a few questions that I ask everyone okay. at the end. Um, how do you feel about your role in and contribution to rock history? as a whole. Hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let me <Just> think. <laughs> Amazed. Uh, blessed. Um, lucky as hell. Um, again, it's nothing I planned for. In a lot of ways, it just seems like It happened to me, and I, I didn't really contribute to it, but I know I did. I don't know. It's I don't know how to answer that. I really don't. Um, you know, I'm happy to be thought of in 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 that particular way, and um, I think everybody who has this long of a history in any profession um, has made a contribution, and um, a lot of it's just being there. You know, being able to do it for that long. And, and um, affecting that many people. I think that was one of the biggest things that, that, um, that we accomplished, especially that Dead, Dead Moon accomplished. 
is actually relating and hitting that many people. Um, what are your thoughts on the visibility of women in rock history in general? Um, is there a gender discrepancy? Is it not really an issue anymore? Has it changed? There used to be. Well, it's obviously changed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, you know, it, there's always been women, thank God, involved in, in music. And now they're inv uh, involved in all forms of music. And it's, uh, instead of it being an anomaly, it's, um, um, it's just, it's just there. I think like that women have finally, um, achieved the equality that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. And, um. And luckily, it's not just music. It's in a lot of different um, professions and just in general. I mean, for me to have grown up in the 50s and see what's going on now, it's just mind-boggling. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it really is, you know. And uh, I'll watch different period pieces and uh, realize just how far we've come from them. One of my role models and my mentors was Kate Hepburn. She amazed me growing up. And I'm reading a, a biography uh, about her right now and appreciating the fact that when she was growing up, she's looking up to these women, especially an aunt that she had and her mom who were suffragettes, who were you know, just trying to get the vote, you know, and how amazing that was. And just that there's always been um, enough key women willing to, willing to take those risks to stand out from the crowd, to be, um, you know, scorned and given shit and whatever, you know, to be able to push on and just follow your heart, do what you do, you know, have that particular passion. And for me, it was always, um, it goaded me on rather than, than the other way. Uh, one of the best gigs we ever had was at this um, festival they used to do up in Bellingham, Washington at the 3B. And there it was, it was all guy bands at that point. There was hardly any women that were playing, you know, harder music. And uh, <laughs> I happened to, I happened to, all these guys were so competitive too, which is great. I'm competitive, whatever. Happened to walk by this one table and one of the guys goes, oh, psh, we're going to kick their ass. They got a girl in the band. And I'm like, <laughs> my it was like, oh, really? <laughs> okay. Bring it on. Let's go. You know, we had one of our best shows that night. <laughs> I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so luckily, there's always, you know, there's always mm, that element out there um, that, honestly, that pushes you on to do more, stretch yourself more, experiment more, you know, just get out of your comfort zone and, uh, and amaze yourself that you're capable of it. I think half the time that's how stuff is accomplished by, by any of us is just, you know, doing stuff you didn't think you were capable of. And then, yeah. then you go, wow, wow, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you most proud of personally and or professionally? A lot. Um, I'm proud of being well-rounded of having kids, of being married for 50 years, of making a successful business, um, making my individual mark in music, um, just having a complete life, really. And um, having it amaze other people as much as it amazes me. <laughs> Because <laughs> it really does, and as I sit back and look, think back on stuff, it, um, I know it's real. I have all the memorabilia around me and all the memories in my head, and but it, you know, it's taking on that. It was one amazing dream that I had. Quality, you know, as time goes on. But yeah, it's, um, you know, just pretty proud of it all. I really am. Okay, last one. Um, how do you feel about the category, uh, like women of rock or women in rock? Mm -hmm. Um, is it helpful or hurtful 
necessary or yeah. unnecessary. Everybody's got to put a label on, on everything. I mean, it's just kind of human nature, isn't it? Um, it, you know, it, um, it makes it a specific separate thing, which kind of has, you know, a down uh, connotation to it. But it's still inevitable. I mean, regardless of whether we want to think that everybody is um, not gender conscious, you are. You know, I mean, there's no getting around it. <laughs> Let's get real. Um, so, you know, it's a, uh, you know. I hope we get to the point where that won't be necessary, <laughs> you know. And it'll just be more about, uh, you know, musicians, period. Male and female. Mm -hmm. No difference. You know. That's the name of my new project. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Named by Tony <Tunico. laughs> Cole. Um, okay. It's hard to fit, you know, 70 years of a life into an interview. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything really important? to you that you want to add or anything that I didn't ask that you wanted to talk about? Um, I just want to say um, thank you to all the people who have done such amazing things for us over the years, for the work that went into this Dead Moon book, for the work that Jason and Kate did for two or three years to get the Dead Moon documentary together, for people who have made things and pictures and done amazing artwork and just and you have no idea how many mementos I have in this house that are things people have made and given to us on tour and at gigs and personal items that they've given because they they want to share something with you and um, thank you so much for making us a part of your life you're a part of mine Thank you, Tootie. <laughs> <laughs>